I remember as a child, my, uh, my Uncle Bobby taking me to the drive-in theater to see the very first Star Wars movie. And we were, we were laying on the roof of his car as I watched those words, right? As I watched in awe as those words scrolled upward into space. And then it was just mind-blowing when those ships came from the top of the screen firing at one another. As you watch the movie, we're soon introduced to a couple of, of droids whose names are R2-D2 and C-3PO. You see, their, their ship had been captured by the Empire, and they were sent out on this mission to deliver a message to a man named Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, that message is discovered by Luke Skywalker, and, and that made him join this mission, and, and he was seeking out an old man that he knew as Old Ben Kenobi. And it was a message from Princess Leia. Those of you who have seen the movie, do you remember the message? The message was, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You are, you're my only hope. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about things like love and grace and mercy and faith. And last week, we had that message about, uh, about justice. Well, today, I want us to consider hope. What is it? What is hope? Hope is to long for and to expect the fulfillment of a promise. Hope is the anticipation that the future will turn out better than the present. Hope is what makes a disappointing today bearable because of the possibility of a brighter tomorrow. It's like a man who was watching a Little League baseball game one afternoon. He asked the boy in the dugout, you know, he said, what's the score? And the boy says, well, it's 18 to nothing. We're behind. Wow, said the man. I bet you're discouraged. Well, well why should I be discouraged, said the little boy. We haven't even had a chance to bat yet, right? That's hope. So in this series of messages, we've not only been talking about these concepts, but we've also been talking about, you know, the biblical truth and then uh, false views that people today have about these concepts. And so today what we're going to talk about is the real reason to have hope. And that's what I want to encourage you with today is there is a reason to be hopeful. But unfortunately, many people have misplaced their hope. They are hoping in the wrong things. And we can see this very clearly as we approach this year's presidential election, right? Like, listen to this, church. Our hope is not in who or who doesn't become president of the United States. Now, that will determine the direction of our country because in this election, those two sides are dramatically different. And, and I have my preferred future for our country and will vote accordingly. And, and you will vote for your preferred candidate. But let's never for, forget this important thing. It does not matter if things go well or if things fall apart because our hope is not in one political party or another. The only hope for people, the only hope for this world is Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Because I do. And realize when we talk about politics, uh, the two options are whether things fall apart quickly or whether things fall apart slowly, right? I mean, the options are whether we can delay the end or whether we are ushering it in all at once. Like that is a reality that's been prophesied about in Scripture, that the world will get really bad right before the end. The Old Testament prophets prophesied to that, and, and as a fact, so did Jesus, and so did Peter, and so did Paul. And if we do not hope in Jesus, there is no hope. 
Let me say it again. If we do not hope in Jesus, there is no hope. We're we're like the man called No Hope Carter. A, A group of students were visiting a psychiatric institution to observe all of these uh, different mental illnesses. And one of the guys there, uh, it was a very tragic case, and they referred to him as No Hope Carter. The reason for that is he was the victim of a venereal disease, and he was going through its final stages when the brain begins to be affected by it. And before he, uh, as he began losing his mind, his doctors told him that at this point there was really no, no cure for him. And he begged for some kind of hope, but he was told that the disease had run its course and the only option was death. And so gradually, as his brain deteriorated, he became more and more despondent. And two weeks before his death, he was seen pacing his small room in agony, with his eyes staring blankly, repeating over and over over again, no hope, no hope, no hope. Well, without Jesus, without Jesus, there is no hope. One of my favorite verses to share during funerals is that section there in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. What those verses say is, uh, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So even during, like, you know, times of death, we are not to be like the rest of mankind because they have no hope. And our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is founded in the fact that he was killed, but what did he do? He defeated death, he rose from the grave, he ascended to heaven, and he is coming back. And when he returns, even those who have died in Christ will rise back to life, and we will all be with Jesus forever. Do you believe that? And see, this is why more important than the state of the country? Listen to this. This is why more important than the state of the country is the state of the Lord's church. What is the state of First Christian Church in Meadville, Pennsylvania? And if you're watching this from, from somewhere else in the country or in the world, uh, what is the state of the church you are a part of. Now, though our country operates on a two-party system, the Lord's Church cannot do that. I'm not sure if you if you read uh, this past month's newsletter, but but I wrote this article on the front of the newsletter about Abraham Lincoln and about how Lincoln quoted. Jesus when addressing the issue of slavery in the United States, right? And Lincoln actually quotes Mark 3.25, which says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, listen to those words, church. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And Lincoln expounded upon the truth that the United States had to choose. And it would either be pro-slavery or it would be anti-slavery. But it had to be one or the other. It could not be both. 
And here is why it is so sad when there is division in the Lord's church. It's so sad because the church is, is supposed to exist to be a representative of Jesus in the world. The church is supposed to be accomplishing the Lord's mission in the world. So what is the only hope for the world? The only hope for the world is Jesus and his church. The only hope is Jesus and his church. I shared at our prayer gathering a few weeks ago um, that I've, you know, spoken to church leaders, not only in this particular area of the country, as well as other parts of the country. And um, the same thing is happening in churches all across the country. Now, what is, what is that? Um, division. Unexpected outbursts of hatred. Hidden bitterness coming to the surface. Long-standing feuds coming to a head. Sometimes people just up and leaving the churches. And one of the church, I spoke to a leader in that church, one of, the, one of the churches went from 300 in the 300s to 80 people. Another one went from 400 to 150 people because of division. Now, we could say that that's a, um, a sociological phenomenon caused by the shared stress of isolation right? Due to limited quarantine. We, we could say that. But you know what I believe it is? I believe it is the devil and his forces attacking the only hope for mankind. Jesus and his church. At a, at a site called churchanswers.com, it's, it's uh, run by um, a man named Tom Rainer. I've, I've quoted Tom Rayner before in the past, but um, Rayner shares facts about churches that become divided and then, and then eventually wind up splitting. And, and a few of them are this. He says, churches divide. Uh, churches become divided not because of new people coming into the church, but churches divide because of feuds among long-standing members who see themselves as the ones to exercise power in the church. He says churches become divided because of the country club mentality. Like, so people decide they are the ones who give and, and then they feel like they should get their way. And when they don't get their way, they either stop giving or, re or they reduce their, their contributions. Country club church, right? And a divided church is a dying church. And sadly enough, that, real that reality seldom motivates the church to unity. Let me say that again. A divided church is a dying church. And, and sadly enough, that, that seldomly motivates the church to unity. Now, another reality is, Rayner says that the convenient and most visible scapegoat, once problems develop, the convenient and the most visible, visible scapegoat is the preacher. This stress affects his marriage, it affects his children, it affects his health, and it makes most ministers cynical in their outlook of the church and the state of the kingdom of God. And if the preacher loses hope, no one else is going to have it. My hope is built on nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Christ is the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. And, and I want to say this so that you, there's no doubt about where I'm coming from on this. I believe wholeheartedly in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say that? I believe wholeheartedly in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not sure if you realize the work that um, I'm, I'm sure I can speak for other families um, that have decided to be in full-time ministry, but, but I'm not sure you realize the work that Wendy and I have put into trying to be God's people. The sacrifices we have made for decades now to try to share the good news with the lost and trying to equip God's people to join us in that mission. And we've not always been perfect in that. But that is our life's goal. I went back home last week and was able uh, to be with family because my grandmother Gibson went to be with the Lord on September 11th. And a, and a part of it broke my heart. Because I don't get to know my extended family. I've had cousins that I grew up with, I've known since childhood, that have, um, that have died over the last few years. I've had weddings happen that I haven't been able to be a part of. Um, because I just simply couldn't be there. Because for nearly 30 years now, this thing called the church has been our family. Because we've chosen to try to be Jesus and we've given our time to the church and the church is very demanding. And I think of those words of Jesus in the Gospels, like uh, one account of it is in Matthew chapter 12, where it says, while he was speaking to the people, his uh, mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak with him. And he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 
do you want to know what I need from you? Do you, do you want to know what I need from you? I need you to do the will of my Father in heaven. I need people to stop making excuses and decide to be the family of God. I need Christians not to bicker and fight. I need you to not gossip. I need you to not talk behind the scenes and get each other riled up about issues. See, honestly, you're the only family we have. And I need you to commit yourself to doing the will of God. Last week, I got probably one of the most wonderful, thoughtful cards I've ever received in the mail. And, and, I, and I won't reveal who it was from, I only, and I'll only read a bit of it to you, but it was from a very, a very encouraging sister in Christ. And um, she said, as a part of the card, she said, um, my heart aches for you. Although you were not yet the pastor at FCC when I first came here, I truly believe you are the reason God led me to this particular church. I have experienced tremendous spiritual growth under your teaching and your leadership, and I thank God for placing you in my life. And then later in the card, she writes Isaiah 33, 6, which says, He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. That meant so much to me. And it wasn't because it was a stroking of my ego or my pride. It is, first of all, that she noticed that I was struggling. And secondly, that she spoke right to something that I care very deeply about. Helping people know the Lord and growing in their relationship with the Lord and engaging in ministry and those people engaging in ministry to other people. And so this woman is a servant of God and a servant of other people. So when I read that card, I heard, Jim, I'm sorry about your I'm sorry that you're hurting. I, I know what you care about and, and you have done that. I know what you care about and you have done that. People, that is all, that is all I want. That is the passion that Jesus placed in my heart when I received the Holy Spirit at my baptism. And that has been the direction of my life now for a long time. Now, we are all shaped in different ways. We all have different strengths uh, to add to this thing called the body of Christ. But we all must be unified in moving toward that goal. We cannot be petty. We cannot be hateful gossips. And if you're that way, if, if you are that way, um, you need to be placed in time out. Because spiritually mature people don't do that. So if you're doing that, you're in timeout. And, and spiritually mature people also refuse to entertain the devil when he comes calling. So first Christian church, what will you be? Will you be that country club church? Because across the country, those churches are being shown for who they are. Or are you going to be the Lord's church? Because his church is going to be obvious as well. His church 
stands victorious over the gates of hell. His church has a clear mission in the world, and his church trains and prepares God's people to accomplish that mission. And we cannot be both. A house divided will not stand. It will be one or the other. Someone once wrote, having hope propels us to achieve our dreams and drives us forward toward our pursuits. It also keeps us afloat when everything seems to go wrong, when we feel that we are drowning. Hope is the light at the end of the tunnel, the northern star by which we navigate our lives through trials and difficulties toward our dream of a better day. And when we lose hope, we're like a rudderless ship being tossed about without direction. Having and finding hope then is essential for keeping our dreams upright and continuing to sail in the direction of their attainment. Or as John Maxwell says, if there's no hope for the future, there's no power in the present. And the only hope for this church and the only hope for any of y'all who go to different churches who are watching this, the only hope is choosing to be Jesus' church, choosing to be the Lord's church. Because by making his goals our own, by remembering and valuing his message and his methods, only then can we attain the very thing we are left here for? Don't be like the rest of men who have no hope. I'm going to go ahead and lead us in a prayer as we close out. And uh, so everybody, just let's kind of bow our heads together and pray. Father God, we come to you today, and I'm just so thankful for Jesus that you've given to us. What Paul wrote there in Thessalonians is so true. Um, even though we, you know, experience death and we have family members that die and, and we see that happening, we do not need to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope because we, we believe things. We believe that Jesus came and died and rose again. We believe the day is coming when he's going to return and he's going to, to raise the dead and we are going to be changed in an instant and we will all be together with him. And Lord, that is our hope, that is we look forward, that is what we look forward to, and that is what determines what we do in our time that we have left here. We need to be about accomplishing your goals and your mission. Lord, help us to do that. Help us as a church to be unified. Help us to, um, help us to make such an impact on the world that all of these things that we're seeing, the craziness that we see going on, that um, we understand what the solution is. <laughs> It's the church being salt and light. It's Christians deciding to step up and to change their world. And I pray that you give us the boldness to do that. Pray with anybody who, uh, who's con considering making a decision, giving their life to you, that they are motivated to do that, that they do that um, as soon as possible. We, we don't know how much time we have left, Lord. And so we come to you and we ask for your mercy and your grace. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.